Welcome to Business Conversations with your host, business strategist, Clive Enova. Clive is joined by expert guests as they talk business behind the scenes to give you the tools and insights to support your growth, security and serenity as you strive for your success. Welcome to another episode of Business Conversations with Clive Enova. I am Clive Enova, business strategist, and we're having a conversation with Rita joy Ann about how to turn your information session or keynote into a talk that generates leads and sales. Rita used her extensive learning and development skills to create the passion process and the signature speaking success system. Both of these help people find their true passion and also attract clients. Rita is a recognized and in-demand speaker throughout Australia, New Zealand, the Middle East, and South Asia, including being chosen to represent Australia as part of the Australian delegation in Japan at the G20 Young Entrepreneur Alliance. Hello, Rita, and welcome. Hey, Clive. Thank you for having me. That's an absolute pleasure, but I'm going to talk to my writers. That was a heck of a mouthful. (laughs) We'll make it easier. We'll make it easy throughout this interview. (laughs) Yes, we'll we'll just have a lovely little conversation and we won't worry about big words. (laughs) Yeah. Into that. You were part of the Australian delegation in Japan at the G20 Young Entrepreneur Alliance. What on earth is that all about? So the G20 is where the G20 countries get together and discuss where the G economy is going to go. And so prior to the world leaders getting together, there are delegations that go before that big event. And as the Young Entrepreneur Alliance, you get chosen to represent Australia to go and talk about the business landscape in Australia in conjunction with where the other G countries are at. And so that was just, I was part of a delegation that went out to Japan. This is pre-COVID 2019. And I got to have the extraordinary experience of speaking to other G20 countries about Australian businesses, where the landscape is, and my thoughts about where the where it's all heading towards. Excellent opportunity. And no doubt you met some pretty interesting people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, from Canada to the States to England, I mean, all the G20 nations are there and you're building contacts, you build networking, you're getting to know people you would never have met before. And the conversations are just wonderful, really, because how else would you get that opportunity? Absolutely. And now you have me wondering if this is a precursor for future, because as I look around the leaders of the world, I notice that they all went to school together or they met at events like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know if they've met at events like that, but definitely the connections that you make at these events are pretty extraordinary. I mean, they're pretty, you can you go to net, local networking events and that's great, but then you go to international events where you get, I guess, selected to represent a country. Now, now you're talking about, you know, people who have done some amazing things that you could only read about or that you might see a YouTube about, but then at that level, you're actually meeting them and discussing it and talking to them about how they did it, what they did. And that blooms and creates more of a, I don't know, a community that you never thought you'd be part of. Yeah, you speak very clearly and you speak very well and with great enthusiasm. I'm pretty sure there's a female prime minister popping up for Australia somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> You have a lot of confidence and kindness, I really do. Not looking to be the Prime Minister at all. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Look, that is absolutely excellent. We'll probably come back to that during our, our chat. But tell us about Rita. Who's Rita? Where is she? Where have we found you geographically? Geographically, I'm in Canberra, Australia. And so basically I run a business, a training business from Canberra and I teach people emotional intelligence and I train people on how to use speaking to generate leads, clients and sales. And so geographically in the world, I mean, the capital, the nation's capital of Australia. An excellent place to be. Mm-hmm. The best museums and the best arts, etc., are up there. You know I it is. how that came about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It tell is. us a bit tell us a bit more about Rita. What's Rita's family like? My family. Well, my background, I'm from Afghanistan and we came out to Australia just when we had, there was a war in Afghanistan. As anyone that comes out of war, you become a refugee. And as part of being a refugee, we were in India for a while and then got to Australia eventually. Thank God, after a quite a long struggle to get to here. And one of the reasons why I started or I got into business and initially my, my first business is helping people unravel 
what they're good at, what their greatest strength is. And I did that because, well, I got the shot to come out of Afghanistan, live to tell the tale like I am on this interview. And I have cousins back home and war has just broken out again in Afghanistan after the US have come out of it, um, left Afghanistan. And so I've got cousins back home. I've got relatives who didn't make it out. And so for me coming into corporate Australia, I found that to find what you're good at is an absolute necessity because your ability to know your strength is your ability to help yourself, help your community and help a greater good. And that's how I got into business really is because of my background, the fact that I needed to know what I was good at because I had a chance that only a very small fraction get to have when you are escaping war and becoming a refugee. Yes, it's an interesting journey and I wish we had time to explore it further, but of course, that's not why we're here. We actually want to tell people about what it is that you do. And you mentioned something very important about people knowing themselves and it seems to be something that we as people have tremendous difficulty with. And I'm reminded that a fellow called Aristotle, who was around in the first century BC, Mm. (laughs) one of the really important lines that is credited to him is know yourself. What do you think it is, Rita, that stops us from really knowing who we are and what we're good at and why, et cetera? That's an excellent question, Clive. One of the fundamental reasons why we don't know who we are is because we have been pigeonholed into a particular type of thinking. And that is when you go to school, you need to be good at certain subjects to be recognized. If you're not good at those subjects, then you have less value because school says if you're a good reader, you're in the blue group and the blue group is the highest reading group. And if you're not a good reader, then you're in the green group. And so those classes and how the labels are had from kindergarten up until year 12, they force you to be a certain person or pigeonhole you. And if you're not academically inclined, then anything else that you're good at is not recognized. And as such, once your year of manufacture, like class of 88, class of 89, class of 2006, whatever you graduated as, once you finish school, you either have a label of whether I'm good at something or not. And then once you go into university and then you get a good job, The promised land, the whole reason why you went to school was the promise of a good job. And then once people are unhappy, it's like, well, what am I good at? I never found that out because the opportunity was never given. Because if you weren't good at what the school said or the curriculum said you need to be good at, automatically you had self-doubt, automatically you lost yourself. And that's why knowing yourself becomes very hard because in the years where you're supposed to recognize who am I and to know thyself, You didn't know thyself, you knew the curriculum, you knew how to please a teacher or how to get through it so that you could at least graduate, get a certificate and be be accepted in society, if that makes sense. Is there an optimal time period, Rita, when people could, should maybe learn who they actually are? Yeah, right now, whatever whatever stage you're at whether you're 15 or you're 55 or you're 105. The time to know it is now because I say that self-awareness, knowing who you are is your superpower. When you know how you get triggered, when you know what emotionally gets you charged up, you become better at business. You become a better mother, father. You become a better sister, citizen, because knowing yourself, then you don't get cut away from the distractions. When you know yourself, you know how you operate and that allows you to divorce yourself from everything that'll take you away from what you want to be able to do and accomplish and contribute to. And seeing as now is the right time, is there a particular method that we should follow to help ourselves find ourselves? Yeah. So that's the whole thing I've taught when I first started in business, which is the passion process of how to uncover what it's how to find your passion minus your resume. And to start it off, there's three questions you should be asking. Number one, what did I enjoy doing as a kid and why? Question number two is what are my hobbies, skills or talents? And follow that up with why do I enjoy those hobbies, skills and talents? And then question number three is, What contribution do I aspire to have and why? And the reasons those three questions will uncover for you, what is, what are you good at? What is your strength? Is because asking about what you did as a kid 
reveals your inner child. That's the thing that was ignored, put to the side, you had to bury because you had to get through school. The second question is what are your skills, hobbies, and talents? That reveals how you currently occupy your time and your reasons why. And then the last thing is, well, what contribution do I want to have? That looks at fulfillment. Because at the end of the day, the reason why you're in business is because you found a way to do something better, more effectively, more efficiently than somebody else. And it's the vehicle you choose called business is the vehicle that you chose to make a difference in the world. And so really nailing what contribution you want to make is going to give you that fulfillment that, you know, people crave even when they're doctors, even when they're lawyers, the professions that are sought after. These people come to me because they don't have fulfillment. And so that third question, what contribution do I want to have in the world, will give you that, that oomph or that will fill that void. Which, of course, is the, the passion part of that, is yeah. identifying what it is that we want to do. When we identify the right thing, it naturally is filled with passion, isn't it? Well, it is. The thing that scares people the most about passion, because people always think, I don't know what my passion is, I don't know what I'm good at, I don't know what I'm good at. And I always say to people, you do know what you're good at, because once you do the process or you ask yourself what energizes me, you will get to your passion. The hard part is, is following through, because what your passion is not that hard, but following through on it, that's when your doubts, your hesitations, excuses, you're too tired, I can't be bothered, that's all comes up, I'd rather watch this show. That's what's really going, and that's when you come face to face, and that's when you get to know yourself. When you're forced with becoming uncomfortable because now you know what you're good at, but going after it requires you to evolve from who you are. And then that creates an understanding, a new level of understanding of who you are, what your hesitations are. And that once again reintroduces yourself to, well, who am I? Do we hesitate and procrastinate over those things because we're embarrassed? By our passion? No, it's because we don't think we can do it because I don't have the time. I don't have the education. I, it's locked down at the moment. I'm going to wait till my kid goes back to school. I just don't think I can achieve. I've never done a thing like that. And it's usually because I have to rewrite the rules because as much as I want to pursue my passion, I'm scared of it because I have to go down a path that I've never been on before. And it's an uncharted territory. Whereas Going to school, getting a degree, getting a good job was charted out for me. And I knew A, B, C, D, where I'd have to land. Even though I was unhappy with it, I still knew where I, my direction was. Now when I'm going through my passion, oh my God, I've got to actually craft this new path. And what if it doesn't work? What if I fail? What if it never works out? And that's the hard part of actually following through on something that you want to do, but there is no proven track for it. I like to think that with all the people who work with me, Rita, that everybody follows the same journey. They're all on the same journey. Mm -hmm. They all follow a different path. And mm -hmm. it seems to me from what you're saying that we actually have tremendous skills and uh, most of us could perhaps be doing better than what we are, but we stop ourselves. So, okay, what if we are sitting around thinking, golly, I, I could do something, but I've got no idea what. And I've asked myself the questions that you just ran through. Mm -hmm. And the answers that came back didn't enlighten me a great deal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Should we just ask them again? Should we ask the questions again? Yes. Uh, well, absolutely. I mean, the only reasons, I mean, I actually, I'm very active on TikTok and I teach a lot of this on TikTok. And one of the questions that people come with me when I teach this on, in videos, they come back with comments as, why am I finding it so hard to answer these questions? Or uh, the opposite end is, oh my God, you've just ignited in me how I'm supposed to go about this. I've never known this. Why am I only finding out now? These are the questions to ask. And the reason why there are two different spectrums with a, yes, this is what I needed, or, oh my God, I don't even know how to answer the questions, is because we've been so disconnected. If you're finding it hard to ask, it's so we're so disconnected from what is what we naturally gravitate towards. And so what I would ask you to do, if you can't ask any of those questions or you can't get an answer, is make a list of everything that you hate. Because that comes naturally. What you can hate, what you don't like, what you dislike comes naturally to you. It's easier than, than not finding out, well, what do, I, what do I want? What do I like? But once you get down on paper what you absolutely hate, don't like, distrust, then it's easier to say the opposite, gives you more clarity of what you want to gravitate towards. So if in that instance, you're like, I have no idea, then make a list of everything you hate 
And then that will give you the key or the opposite, give you clarity to what it is that you are going to incline towards and enjoy. And these businesses that you've set up, mm -hmm. we heard about the passion process and how you go about that. The signature speaking success system, where did that come from? How did it come about? Yeah. So when I was working in corporate, I found that my job in corporate was learning and development. And I would get hired out by companies to solve problems. And the problems were training problems that I would have to roll out. And in my assessment of what training I had to roll out, I found that the core reason why people were not performing in sales or customer service or productivity was that they didn't enjoy their jobs. And it just surfaced into a sales problem. Not enjoying your job surfaced into a productivity problem. But management didn't want to hear that. But I knew that there was this real need for teaching people, well, what am I good at then? So I decided to teach that for myself, to start a business and use my skill set in learning and development. I put together a process of uh, recognizing how that works, which is three of the questions that I just went through. And I realized that I, I had a business uh, website. I had business cards. I did mail drops. I had brochures. I did advertising. I had social media. I had everything to say that I was in business, but nothing to show for it. I had no clients. And so I hadn't done one thing. And the one thing that I hadn't done was speaking. And it scared me because speaking is very confrontational. You know, I had a general manager saying my work was good. So I knew it was good. But when you work for yourself, you ain't got nobody telling you your work is good enough. I took myself to the Mind, Body and Soul Festival in Melbourne. And I delivered my first talk in 40 minutes about how to find your dream job. And in 40 minutes with complete strangers in the room, I went from stranger to having clients. I mean, I'm not talking people interested. I'm talking people putting down their credit card details to work with me. And that fundamentally changed the way I saw marketing, the way I saw speaking. And after doing that one marketing strategy of speaking and getting clients, I became Young Businesswoman of the Year in Canberra. And then since then, I've also been teaching people how to be able to use speaking as a tool in business to generate leads, clients, and sales. So that's how it all came about, me teaching speaking to get clients, because I needed it when I was teaching how to find your passion. Now, there are plenty of places, Rita, we can go to learn about speaking and whether or not we have difficulty with speaking, we can mm -hmm. learn to speak better and say better things. But you added that little bit extra onto it to win clients and get sales. Mm -hmm. How does that happen? So I don't teach public speaking. Well, I don't teach you how to use your voice or how to use your hands. Or I don't teach public speaking. What I teach is how to structure a talk that allows you to generate clients. So you don't need to be a professional speaker. You don't need to be a speaker. You just need to be in business and want to use speaking as a marketing tool. And the way you do that is usually in an information talk or an education talk or a keynote, you start by writing, you know, when you're thinking about what I'm going to say, you start by writing, you know, introduction. Hi, I'm Rita. I'm going to talk to you about X, Y, and Z. And then you just run into it. But with a talk that you're trying to generate business for, and you're representing your business, you never start writing the introduction. You begin by writing, what is it that I want the audience to do when I finish speaking? In other words, what is my offer going to be? When you start by thinking and writing, what is my offer? And you nail down your offer, then and only then do we reverse engineer the talk. And that's when we start with the introduction and the body. And the reason we do that is because we want everything to point to the offer. But to have that happen, you need to start with what it is exactly that I want the audience to do. What's my offer going to be? How do I incentivize people when they when I have an offer for people? And then we start with the, the introduction and the body so that everything points to the offer. Does that make sense? Am I making sense or am I? Absolutely making sense. Perfect sense. Because why don't we know ourselves? Because we're not clear. How do we find clarity? Well, if you have an idea what you'd like to achieve, even if it's a bit furry, mm -hmm. <laughs> you can start writing a story. And as you look at the story, you can find out that, hang on, that doesn't help. And you can hang, find out that, oh, 
that helps. Yeah, and if we find enough, oh, that helps, and we get rid of enough, that doesn't help, we're probably going to have a good story, aren't we? Yeah, but I mean, it's, it goes way beyond a story, though, uh, Clive, because uh, when, when you deliver a talk, you can actually trial your product or service before you create it. I mean, the first time I delivered my talk, I delivered a membership program, and I did not pr have a membership program, but I made an offer to the audience. The audience purchased it. And then I went and created the membership program and I only charged people once I delivered the program. And so the benefit of speaking is you can actually test the market with a signature talk, with a speak to convert signature, you can test the market, see if people are really interested before you spend time, love, tears, creating something, offer it to your audience. And then if they buy it, now you go create it and only charge when you deliver it. Because the opposite is you go and put time, energy, and putting into a product and then you think well where's my market so putting a story it's beyond a story it's about really giving your business legs to to just test a market and really get a feel for your audience and you know that you're going to only deliver what the audience wants because you've pre-sold it and of course they've told you what it is they want exactly exactly <laughs> when you've helped people find their way of speaking. What have you noticed about those people? What have I noticed about those people in terms of their business, in terms of in what sense? How do they behave? Any Do they behave differently? Do they feel more confident? Do they appear more confident? Do things happen around them that they want to have happen? Yeah, because they make an offer. Like, for example, when COVID hit last year and Everything was down, like everything, all events were down and everything became online. And then opportunities popped up because now Zoom Airlines <laughs> became so popular because now you can actually make offers and do presentations online. And so because of that, I was able to go and speak to a lot of places via Zoom in England. And one of my clients who I generated through speaking on Zoom, making an offer, she wanted to fill her workshops for busy mums. And that's exactly how she was filling her events is that she was on zoom she made offers and usually she'd have to post every day she'd have to you know go to all these networking events online and now she was just delivering a talk and filling her events her workshops and this was game changing she's a busy mum she's trying to build a business and doing it during COVID times when events are either open or closed and the lockdown back and forth and so not only confidence but your business actually accelerates because you're not relying on an algorithm on Facebook to help you. You're not relying on a webmaster to change your website or you're relying on anyone else. You have a talk that's ready to go that enables you to generate clients to rinse and recycle the same talk over and over again to different audiences. And so not only does your confidence increase, but your ability to communicate and inspire people to take the solution that you offer that's what's changes because now you believe in yourself in a whole different way when traditional marketing, you know, it's so crowded that this speaking and learning to speak to convert completely changes your ability not only to speak, but your ability to gain clients for your business. Which brings us back to where we started as we need to know ourselves. And we could go on talking about this for hours. I, <laughs> I, I know we could, Rita. <laughs> Definitely. But the clock is against us. But before I let you go, Rita, mm -hmm. what is the best tip you have received from a business conversation? The best tip that I've received is manage your mind. And manage your mind means that it doesn't matter how you feel. It matters how you finish. So last year, I'll give you an example of that. Last year, my amazing, beautiful father passed away during COVID. He's my hero. He's the man that took us out of Afghanistan during war, during being a refugee. This man led us, the level of leadership. This is my father. You know, he is my hero. When COVID hit last year and my gorgeous dad went back to his creator, in my uh, tradition, I'm Muslim. And so we have three days of mourning. And after the third day, you can take more time off and mourn. But I realized that I wanted to, I had a, an engagement, a speaking engagement on Zoom at 3 a.m. in the morning on day four after my father had passed away. And I could have canceled that engagement and the host would have understood it. But I went through with it because pushing yourself in a way that helps you to accelerate 
is what creates resilience. And there were moments when my father probably thought there's, there's gun warfare, there are grenades blowing up. I'm sure my parents would have thought, should we just not move? Should we just stay here? And if death comes, we accept it. But they still move forward. And that's a very extraordinary example. But that's the example that I use in business. Sometimes it doesn't matter how you feel, it matters how you finish. Because your work, your priorities, your mission is greater than your feelings. And I'm not saying that you discard your feelings, I'm saying there's a way to manage it. And managing your mind is a huge part of that because we are only as good or as only as efficient or effective as how we're allowing ourselves to be triggered emotionally. And so managing your mind is important because business is not what you do when you're happy. Business is not when you do and it's all great. It's to manage your mind when it all just flakes, when you lose someone you love, when there's war, when you're escaping. That's managing your mind. And that's your number one key. And that comes down to what we discussed, which is knowing yourself and how to manage your own mind versus looking at another YouTube video and think getting inspired. Excellent advice. Speaking of advice, what's the top piece of advice you would like to leave listeners with today? The top piece of advice would be that, listen, you speak anyway. Every day you speak, whether it's to your child or to, at a networking event, whether you're speaking on social media, you speak anyway. What would it change if you learned how to speak so that you could convert? So that any time you spoke, whether it's to an audience of one or 100, whether it's online or offline, you knew how to speak so that it generated business for you. It generated leads, clients and sales. What difference would that make? If the skill that you do every day, which is speaking, you knew how to tweak that so that it could work in your favor and generate business. Excellent. Most importantly, before I let you go, Rita, how can our listeners connect with you to start their own business conversation? Well, that's a great question. You can contact me on unboxyourgift.com or you can email me, Rita, at unboxyourgift.com. And we've just launched a new masterclass on how to be able to turn your information keynote into a speak to convert talk. So if that interests you, then email me reader at unboxyourgift.com and we will send out that masterclass to you for free. There you are. And the URL is as simple as it sounds, unboxyourgift.com. Yes. No breaks, just unboxyourgift.com. Rita, it's been wonderful having this conversation with you. Thank you for bringing such enthusiasm and passion. Thank you so much for having me, Clive. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for listening to another episode of Business Conversations with Clive Enova. Make sure you subscribe to future episodes via your favourite podcast app and you can find more business resources at cliveenova.com.au.